So welcome. And um, when we think about sales, there's a lot of change going on. And if you've parachuted or you've done, uh, um, you know, wingsuit flying or something like that, you would see in that sort of uh, area there's lots of gains and changes and development and lots of things. Like in sales, there's lots of change. You know, transactions, we're hearing about how customers transact during using the internet. So we know there's lots of change going in sales. But one of the things we've discovered at Banjar is there's actually some things that are staying the same. And I'm going to try and nail three of those tonight. Because I've only got 15 minutes, and as John would know and people in the room that know me, I can talk underwater with a mouthful of marble, so that's going to be a problem to hold me to 15 minutes. But I, I, what I want to start you off first with is, um, does anyone know what this is? Learner's plate. Yeah, fa oh, fantastic, you get a gif. Look at that. <laughs> first class, madam. First class seat. A learner plate. Oh, all right, everyone wants something, don't they? Right? It's a learner's plate, and I've got a 19-year-old daughter that I'm trying to teach how to drive at the moment. Uh, we're emotionally detached, I think, at the moment. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but we give her a learner plate, and wh what's the reason behind a learner plate is that you can make mistakes. So things can go wrong, but it's okay because we're just learning. One of the biggest problems in sales, we worry about the muck up so bad that we don't actually do anything. So you don't learn anything. Just look at our education system. There's a problem there. So for a moment, I want you to take a learner's plate and turn left. So I want you to turn left to the person next to you, and I want you to introduce yourself, just say hi, right? <laughs> and then I want you to say, or ask, or tell, what you do and what you sell. So away you go, it's a very quick exercise, 30 seconds it should take. Who heard something unbelievably brilliant that just got their heart to skip a beat? Yeah, what did you hear? Here we go, here we go. What did you hear? What did he say that made your heart skip a beat? In marketing. Now that's sort of kind of cool. Anyone else hear something dramatically more inspirational than that? Just give her a round of applause. <laughs> you need to speak to John. Okay. I did a conference the other day and I walked up to a bloke and I said, so what do you do, Ben? Because he had Ben written on him, it was obvious. He said, we do IT. I said, cool. <laughs> what sort of IT? He said, oh, ERP systems, these really complex systems. I said, cool. <laughs> well, 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 what does that do? He said, well, we get lots of data for retailers and, you know, they've got data. I said, cool. Well, what's that sort of do? He said, well, it, it, it allows them to have a look at more data and they can, you know, do this stuff. I said, cool. So what? And he said, you're going to keep asking me that question until you get what you want, aren't you? I said, yeah, I am. I said, well, give me the real answer. And he said, well, we grow profits and increase, you know, revenue. I said, now you got me. I said, why don't you start with that tonight, and when you meet people during this next hour, just keep telling that story. He came up and shook my hand later, and he said, I've got all these business cards that I've never had before. Because what did he do? What did he actually sell? The truth and the outcome. So sales starts with authenticity. And what we discovered in our white paper and our, our work to create our white paper, that I just gave one out, and there's a couple up here for the ones that want to take it, is we discovered there's not a big change in technique in selling in the world. In fact, there's only been three empirical changes in the whole history of sales since we could sort of see the first consistent sales process in 1854. There's only been a couple of changes. The change, however, in consumers and the way they're purchasing and what's driving them to purchase has dramatically changed in the last 10 to 15 years. And what we're observing is sales organisations that just can't get their head around that. And it just comes back to the basics. What is it you're selling and why? And what will I get out of it if I work with you? And this is one of the gravities in sales. If we can get that basic messaging right, we can do all sorts of things. When we work on sales, there's four quadrants you've got to th think about. The sales mindset, and we just heard wonderful uh, insight into what happens with mindset. Because if you don't love selling, if you don't love your product, if you're not passionate about what you do, well, then it's really tough to sell it. And what I, all I did is convince Ben that night to be a little bit passionate about what he does with software, which is sort of slightly more boring. <laughs> then we've got to develop some skill sets. And despite popular belief, salespeople are not born, they're trained. 
you know, the midwife to Zig Ziglar's mum didn't stand there and go, wow, Zig Ziglar. He was trained. Yes, he has some attributes that made him a great salesman, but he was actually trained. Then we have tool sets. If you don't have CRM, if you don't have the right sales process, companies with a documented and fully functioning sales process are 21% more profitable ones that aren't. No fact in research paper just came out of the US last year. So we know sales tools work and that'll enable you to build a sales culture that you can then lead. Now most organisations ring us and say, Mike, we need sales training. And I'll go, why? Because uh, uh, HR sent me. Oh cool, that's a good answer. And what they're asking for is up here. Can anyone see the problem and why most sales training fails? It's because it's not catering for the very things that we heard about before and the other areas like social media. Where are the tools in this? It's a complete picture and sales must take that approach. A couple of key things for you. Business model is critical. Now, if you don't understand your business model or it's not clear, and clearly Ben that night didn't understand his, it's really hard to see it. Now, for those of you who have seen the, the famous video by Simon Sinek on TED, if you're watching MasterChef or My Chef Rules or Big Brother or whatever or Game of Thrones at the moment, get on to TED. It's 20 minutes of your life and you'll never look back. Simon Sinek on there, probably one of the most watched videos. And we do this with every company. We get them to think about their what, when that's easy, um, law, accounting, whatever, it doesn't matter, that's easy. It's the how, but then it's the why. And if I look at this organisation, which, um, you know, I, I take my hat off to John and the directors for doing what they've done here. I'm incredibly proud to have been a part of that journey. And, uh, and I'm inspired about being here because they've actually done the why so fabulously well here uh, in this organisation. Get your why right. Our why is to unleash sales potential. That's what we do. That's what drives us. That's my purpose. And that's what I really get passionate about. Yes, we do sales training, recruitment and coaching and all those other stuff, the IT, but it's the why that actually drives us and anchors all our social media, all our marketing, all the stuff. We wrote a white paper so we could help other organisations unleash potential. That's why we did it. So you need to think about your why. I'm also working with a charity. They're called Righteous Puppies. So some of you won't have heard it, but they work with autistic kids. And we do this work for nothing. It's, it's our give back to community. And what they do is they put Labradors with autistic kids to create a filter for crisis. And the science says that autistic kids work much, much better when they've got an animal that they can consult with. It's fabulous. Out of Bendigo, this organisation. And they came to me and they said, oh, yeah, we need some help and all this sort of stuff. And what I identified was a non-for-profit that was begging. So what I did is I taught them how to sell. Now their why is creating champions to realise heroes. The champions of the dogs and the heroes of the kids. They walked into Bendigo Bank about three weeks ago and took their $1,200 donation and turned it into nearly $200,000 worth of donations just because they got their why right. So think about your why. What is your actual purpose? When you get it right, you get some incredible stories to tell. My darling Raymond, though you can't be here for the holidays, we'll always be together in my heart. It's very clear our love is here to stay. Not for a year, but ever and a day. In time, the Rockies may crumble, Gibraltar may tumble, they're only made of clay. But our love is dead. It's very clear our love is here to stay. Not for a year, but ever and a day. Who 
who's just a bit tight in the throat? Who's got a tear in their eye? Absolutely. Why? Why? Because it made you feel something. See, when you get story and your why right, you can create a picture in people's mind that'll get their heart to skip a beat. And that ain't to do with what you do or how you do it. It's the why. And the genius of Steve Jobs to get the why, which was, of course, to break status quo with everything they do, to create a bing in the world. An amazing why. And yes, they make computers and software and apps and all that stuff. It's just stuff. But really, really concentrate. Your customers don't give a stuff about your stuff. They're selfish. And they've got every right to be, because it's their business. It's their world. It's their entrepreneurship. So think about the why. Secondly, you've got to know your zebras. That's a zebra. Let me introduce you to the other piece of the equation here, which, of course, to understand your zebras, you've got to understand a bit about lions. And, of course, a lion pride has a big black bull at the head of it. He's 220 kilos of killing machine. His sole responsibility is sex and security. Good job if you can get it, guys. <laughs> Underneath him <laughs> uh, are the senior lionesses, OK? And I'm, I'm drawing them from behind because I can't draw them any other way. And at 180 kilos, their job is to plan and ambush. And of course, a matriarch female lioness knows that once she grabs a zebra, tosses it to the ground, she doesn't have a gun or a spear. So she actually can't hold on to it for very long. So she needs the girls to turn up. They're the junior lionesses. And at 150 kilos, their sole responsibility is to kill. And this is purely the right Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Underneath them. <laughs> Never had that before. <laughs> underneath them, before <laughs> underneath them are the cubs, of course. One and six get culled on the way through, and they're the world's greatest succession planning. Common goal and vision of the pride is what? To eat, yeah? This pride needs one ton of meat per week to survive. And they've worked out that chasing porky pig around the savannah all day in the heat when 50% chance of them getting away and not being converted and 21 kilos of sinewy, horrible meat is not good business. Put up your hands if you've got customers that are driving you nuts and are not profitable. Be honest. Come on, be honest. Put them right up there. Get them up there. It's a, like it's an outing tonight, right? <laughs> and you're all smart people, I know that. Why have you still got them? See, what lions have worked out is that zebras are really good prey. Of course, they've got no horns, so that's always good. No one gets hurt in the chase. <laughs> I've been teaching this model since 1988. Organisations all around Australia working out who their zebra is. You need to understand who your zebra is. You need to understand what they're about, what drives them, what motivates them. You have to go deep, much deeper than what we've traditionally done. You have to identify the right customers and sack the ones that don't mean anything to you and are not helping you, because they're always going to be the same. And what we know, John and I, is that bad customers take as much energy, if not more, as the good ones. So why? You're smart people. Why do you hang on to them? Let them go. Even better, give them and introduce them to your competitors. <laughs> Let them get tied up for a while. Know the critical criteria. What drives them? We know what drives entrepreneurs. That's why the depot was set up. Go very deep and very narrow. See, traditionally, we've done sales as I'll tell people, I'll do some quotes, I'll build a relationship, but I don't have to go very deep under the surface. I don't have to do much problem solving. The world's changed. We've now got to define challenges. We've got to give them insights. They're going to value you over your stuff, not by your stuff. We have to give them help them reduce complexity. We have to become landmine clearers. So we have to do all these things. So the clients that I work with that I help go very deep and very narrow in their organisations and their customers are thriving at the moment. And they're not losing margin and they're not getting beaten up by procurement departments and tenders and pricing because they've made a conscious decision to do things differently. Lastly, I want to talk about aligning sales. Because alignment is a real problem, especially in engineering. And when you think about it, I started my career in sales. I sold lemonade out the front of mum and dad's, which was a farm and no one drove past, so that wasn't working. So I moved to the city and took up a corporate sales job. 
But and I got into sales training and everything was about tasks. So we, we just did everything around the task. Well, what I've discovered and where my work's now taken me is, of course, there is a strategic angle to tasks. If you don't have the alignment at the top, your business strategy, your why, and the market choice is right, well, then how can you tell a sales team what tasks to do? And more importantly, if you don't know your zebra and its, and its characteristics, how do you ever point them in the right direction and tell them what to do and when and what to say? Of course, if you get all this right, then you can create the very essence of high-performing sales, and that's behaviours. Everything's about behaviours in high-performing sales. The way they speak, the way they connect, the conversations they run, the sales system they engage. Of course, once you have that, you have an environment for high-performing sales. You can build sales management, cross-functional communication reviews. That then enables, of course, the systems to control. As the ex-owner of an IT company, I can't remember how many companies I come to and said, oh, we bought CRM, but sales didn't change. Oh, really? Like it's a silver bullet. But they haven't done any of this stuff, just bought software to hope to change sales. It's majoring in the minors. And then, of course, the beautiful pit at the end of this is you can then recruit the right people, train, coach and develop them, which is the role of great sales managers. So you need to think about where does sales sit in your organisation and is it aligned? Because if it's not, there's going to be a real problem downstream. We know there's a shift going on in the world and we know that organisations are really struggling with the sales game. But that shouldn't be a reason why you can't get it right. Because there's a reason why there's no university for sales anywhere in Australia. Because it's not that hard. Marketing and all this other stuff, performance, emotional intent, there's a lot of science behind that. And sales is actually quite basic. There is a gravity in sales that we've just got to get right. We've got to get process right. We've got to build face-to-face -face relationships. But we must go deeper and narrow into our organisations, our customers, to get on the right side of them to do it well.